Hello everyone, uh, this is the second uh, webinar of uh, our cycle on phenomenology and bioethics. Again, the audience will be mainly uh, composed of students from California State University and Lucerne University. So uh, this seminar will be again uh, an introduction to bioethics, but this time, thanks to Dr. Valeria Bizzarri, we will focus on the disturbance of intersubjectivity. Uh, Valeria Bizzarri is uh, a postdoctoral researcher at the Clinic University of Heidelberg, uh, uh, section Phenomenological Psychopathology and Psychotherapy. Uh, she studies on uh, intersubjective disorders uh, with a special focus on autism spectrum disorder and Asperger syndrome. Her uh, publications include the monograph uh, Sento Quindi Sono, uh, in English I feel that for uh, I am, and uh, the co-edited volume on uh, neurobiology, psychotherapy, pharmacology, invention triangle, recently published uh, in uh, the Cognitive Science and Psychology series. I look forward to this presentation. Her field of expertise is incredibly interesting, so the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and have this opportunity to share my work with you. So I'm going to start this live presentation, if I understood correctly, where it is, I don't know. Okay, I, I have to find the slide. Uh, okay. Can you see the slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. So my presentation will be divided into two main parts. In the first one, I will outline the main important theories about uh, intersubjectivity. Like uh, in the second part, I will describe a couple of uh, disturbances of sociality, namely uh, autism spectrum disorder and melancholic depression. And I will also uh, propose a couple of phenomenological tools um, that uh, hopefully uh, can be helpful in improving the uh, diagnosis, but also the therapeutic uh, moment, the therapeutic process. So what is intersubjectivity? How do you know others? For many years, the debate about uh, intersubjective understanding and empathy in particular has been ruled by simulation theories and theory theories. So simulation theories argue that uh, um, our intersubjective understanding can be reduced to an internal simulation of others' mental states, while uh, theory theories argues, on the other hand, that our understanding of the mind is based on inferential, a merely mental process. Uh, so uh, it's something that happens only in our brain, in our mind. Nonetheless, uh, from my perspective, a representational account of cognition is not sufficient to explain our mental life and the complexity of our intersubjective engagement. In fact, uh, both of those theories, simulation and theory theory, um, are characterized by the following gap. We have a missing experience. The role of experience is undervalued in favor of propositional attitudes or neural models. While uh, recent studies, on the contrary, have shown that uh, from childhood on, our neural system is constantly being modified by social interaction and is constantly evolving. Uh, the last publication of Professor Fuchs that will be also a guest of this seminar is called Ecology of the Brain because, uh, uh, of, because of that, because our brain is something dynamic, is a, an organ which is constantly being modified by the environment. Then we have missing interaction. Both the simulation theory and theory theory consider social interaction as specialized skills which can be placed in the mind or brain of the individual. By contrast, a phenomenological perspective, I mean, for instance, the face-to-face -face meeting described by Schultz, 
focuses on the intentional openness between uh, two agents, and not on a relationship exclusively. And then, last but not least, we have the missing embodiment, the role of corporeality, that except for the mere neural simulation process, is not taken into account by either of the two theories, which seem instead to postulate that the intersubjective encounter is simply a disembodied relationship between two Cartesian agents. So by contrast, a phenomenological perspective, its help will be because uh, um, it allows to affirm that intersubjectivity could involve different intertwined levels. So here I try to schematize, of course, the complexity of our social life, but uh, this schema is not exhaustive <laughs> at all. So we have a co-subjectivity, which is the very first layer and which can also be called open subjectivity by Zavi, for instance and it is the implicit reference to alterity, which is postulated in the perceptual experience. When the subject perceives an object, the absent profiles are co-intentioned as if they would be perceived from another perspective, another here and now. And this kind of intersubjectivity precedes the effective encounter with the other and could be defined as in a priori of the individual structure. For instance, now you are looking at my face, but uh, uh, it's involved in your, uh, um, in your experience, in your perceptual experience that I also have a back and so on. So uh, it's like uh, uh, you are seeing me from a different here and now, different perspectives. Then we have the, if, the effective face-to-face -face meeting, which allows for the analogical argument. I see uh, another being, which is a living body like me, and the perceptive transposition. After this encounter, the subject is destabilized. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> <coughs> because he understands it just one moment, one orientation among others. <laughs> not the only one, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> the world becomes objective and it is conceived as something existing independently of the subjects. And then we have the anonymous community, which we can also define as a sensus communis, and which involves norms, values, and shared cultural issues. So in other words, this uh, further level of intersubjectivity is a sense of belonging to a community or a group that transcends the individual while permeating every moment of her life. So it seems clear that intersubjectivity is not a mere encounter with another individual, but involves different experiences whose primary ground is the capability itself to communicate and to conceive other subjects completely different from ourselves. From a genetic perspective, we can affirm that a disturbance of co-subjectivity, so a disturbance at the very first layer, involves problems at other levels too, to an avalanche effect, which is more or less serious according to the pathology. So in this context, my thesis is that intersubjectivity is grounded in intercorporeality, in corporeality. And this is coherent with the, the interaction theory supported, for instance, by Gallagher. The main thesis of this approach, which, which I support, is that there is a bodily sense of self to which the subject can obtain a direct perception of otherness an otherness which is described in turn as embodied and embedded or as living body inevitably entangled with the world with which it maintains a dynamic relationship of reciprocity and this is consistent with phenomenology in fact the body assumes a fundamental cognitive function and it's considered the true core of perceptual activity, the medium that allows the subject to establish contact with the world and with the alter ego. From this perspective, intersubjective perception could be defined as an interactive and not merely cognitive process. Accordingly, in my encounter with the other, I'm not a mere observer, but I am responding in an embodied way. 
In this context, social cognition becomes synonymous with social interaction, a process in which the body's movements and expression and context also play a key role. And the idea behind this approach is that our intersubjectivity is essentially a direct bodily mechanism, not only during childhood, but also into adulthood. And that we employ in mind reading only in exceptional cases. So this is completely different from uh, um, theory theory, for instance. So what I do in my, in my research project, the main aim of my work is to understand what intersubjectivity really is and which are the necessary uh, elements, the necessary condition of an intersubjective engagement. And in order to achieve my goal in a sort of counterintuitive manner, I take into account social disruption. So uh, I ask myself, uh, what is missing there? In particular, the main intersubjective disturbance that I analyze is uh, autism. Autism is a social pathology par excellence, and uh, it's a um, disorder which is identified in the 1940s of the last century, and that raised the interest of many researchers concerning its real nature, its real core. So on the one hand, we have theories according to which uh, um, autism is, uh, is only a cognitive disorder. It's, uh, it can be described as a cognitive disorder uh, which lies on uh, brain disruption mainly. On the other hand, we have theories according to which uh, uh, autism is a behavioral and affective deficit. Uh, more specifically, in this, just to introduce you to this disorder, uh, the symptoms that characterize uh, mainly uh, autism spectrum disorders are abnormalities in the areas of social development, communicative development, and social imagination, together with marked repetitive or obsessional behavior or unusual narrow interest. Um, I will refer to uh, low function in autism because uh, it involves also motor and cognitive disruption, but uh, especially in the last part of my talk, I will also take into account uh, Asperger syndrome. We can conceive of Asperger syndrome as I function in autism and from a philosophical perspective, this is uh, very interesting because in I function in autism, we have uh, um, a disruption of intersubjectivity while the cognitive and motor domains are uh, intact. So this is uh, very tricky to, to analyze, but also very fascinating and very useful for uh, the understanding of uh, sociality. So I, I want to annoy you with uh, the many theories uh, about uh, autism spectrum disorder that are present in the current debate, but uh, they are uh, useful to me uh, because uh, um, this overview is helpful in, in emphasizing the fact that uh, by oscillating between uh, neural explanation uh, and the behavioral level of explanations, all of these investigations usually rely on a rather general understanding of intersubjectivity, which ignores and undervalues its different forms and the different roles that they have in our social life. We cannot say, okay, uh, autism spectrum disorder is a disorder of sociality without specifying what sociality really is. And uh, we cannot uh, reduce sociality, on the other hand, uh, as a mere neural, this, uh, neural uh, domain or as a behavioral uh, material. So, for instance, uh, uh, the mind blindness theory is uh, a theory which supports the theory of mind. So, according to Baron Cohen, uh, the deficit of autism spectrum disorder is a deficit in reading other's mind. So a deficit which is the circumscribed in the, in the mind and in the brain of the individual. The predictive coding perspective is even more specific and even more reductionist because according to this perspective, autistic observers, so we are confined in the, only in the perception of the world, autistic observers are less influenced by contextual information and they see the world more accurately because the, the perception is less modulated by experience. 
but uh, if you observe also first person reports from an autistic person we can uh, of course uh, argue that uh, there is something more what is at stake here is not uh, just a disruption in the brain but it's something which is uh, rooted in our uh, um, perception and in our lived experience of the world so in my view we can conceive of autism as a disorder of the we that is a disorder of sociality in fact to be an autistic child means with variable degrees of course of severity to be incapable of establishing meaningful social communications and bonds to establish visual contact with the world of others to share attention with the others to be incapable to imitate others behavior or to understand others intentions and emotions while sensations experience difficulties or even the impossibility to orient on the basis of cues provided by others. Autistic subjects are also highly impaired in recognizing human faces or in displaying imitative behaviors. And all of these early manifestations of autism share a common root, the skills required to establish meaningful bonds with others are missing or severely impaired. Here we have one example described by Baron Cohen. It's the case of Andrew, an Asperger subject, so an high functioning autistic subject, who I quote, cannot understand or participate in the things that other people seem to do easily. Things that are so ordinary to other people, such as reading their faces, knowing what to say next in a conversation, knowing how to comfort someone. He had this sense of being a Martian ever since school days when uh, he could see other children playing games in the playground that didn't have clear rules. He had no idea how they knew what to do. He still talks at people rather than to them. And while Andrew can do maths or memorize facts or understand the laws of chemistry or physics effortlessly, he cannot fathom the unspoken rules of human interaction. So what is autism exactly and where the intersubjective impairment really lies? So according to uh, simulation theory, autism, to uh, theory, theory, sorry, autism is caused by a lack of a theory of mind, that is the inability to confirm mental states to others. It has been assumed that this capability is uh, already present in four-year-old children who are able to pass the, the false beliefs test. The main problem with this hypothesis is that it is unable to explain the other symptoms of autism, repetitive actions, specific interests, and so on, and that it does not emphasize the importance of emotion, an element that in my account is very important indeed. Furthermore, we cannot reduce autism to a mere lack of cognitive abilities because many autistic subjects do have a theory of mind. We will come back to this point in the last part of the talk. It's a very important one. According to simulation theory, autism seems to be a behavioral disorder. In fact, according to Baron Cohen, one of, which is one of the main authors uh, to support this thesis, Human activity could be divided into two macro species, empathizing and systematizing. And in this view, autistic subjects have difficulty empathizing, while their systematizing capabilities are hyper-developed. Goldman, in particular, claims that uh, it's precisely a deficit in interpersonal mental simulation, also called empathizing, that seems to characterize autistic individuals. And he adopts a reduction in severe mental illness because uh, uh, we need to, to take into account that the risk of these approaches is not only to undervalue the complexity of intersubjectivity, which is a very important point indeed, but also the complexity of the mental illness itself. We cannot reduce a, a mental pathology only to one level. So why theory theory and simulation theory seems unable to explain this complexity? The phenomenological perspective seems to be suitable to this task. In fact, intersubjectivity could not be reduced either to a mere cognitive process or to a mere simulation mechanism. We also need to take other elements into account, such as context. 
So Husserl, Scheller, and Meloponti have underlined the importance of the pre-reflective and pre-logical experience, as well as the centrality of living corporate in the face-to-face -face encounter. So starting from this notion, we have uh, introduced the interaction theory uh, proposed by Gallagher, and we can uh, uh, outline uh, a vision of, of intersubjectivity as a multi-layered experience that could be divided into primary and secondary intersubjectivity mainly. So in the case of primary intersubjectivity, we refer to that uh, innate ability to relate to others, which is expressed at the level of perception starting from birth, when the baby sees the actions and movements of others and begins to imitate them. With this in mind, the process would seem to resolve itself within the intersubjective direct encounters with the other, and in particular with his uh, living body, his life. Bodily expressions and gestures seem fundamental in the development of an understanding of otherness. These interactions involve the ability to distinguish between the self and others and the proprioceptive sense of one's own body, as well as the ability to discern between animate and inanimate beings. Having a theory of mind is therefore not contemplated, nor does it appear useful at this early stage. The other is perceived as an intentional agent that uses our own expressive language. This innate capacity allows the infant to interpret perceptively and not theoretically the body movements of the other. Uh, Aaron Cohen has called this capacity intentionality detector. In phenomenological terms, we can uh, describe this kind of intentionality as a pre-reflective and bodily intentionality that enables us to be ontologically open to the world. Within this characterization, Baron Cohen traces another feature, the eye direction detector, which is the ability to follow the gaze of the other and consider it significant. As argued by Scherer, our initial perception of othersness is not rational. On the contrary, it implies cognition of body expression and sensory motor capacities. So integrating the Schellerian theory with the uh, observations provided by developmental psychology, we could very well argue that bodily and co-motor elements allow the subject to establish an initial contact with uh, otherness. In this context, corporeality plays a fundamental role. Not only do we see the rage in expressions and movements of others, but it is as if we personally feel the rage with our own body. The passage from a sharing to understanding others' perspective, according to studies by Melzoff and Moore, is gradual and stabilizes around the age of four or five. In other words, our perception of the other is not confined to the primary intersubjectivity. As early as the age of one year, in fact, we can observe the transition from the simple face-to-face -face meeting to what Baron Cohen has described as a mechanism of joint attention. The subject learns to understand the meaning of things, going from dyadic to triadic uh, relations or intersubjective situations which involve the use of objects. This level of intersubjectivity goes beyond the mere encounter with otherness, and it implies imaginative and inferential capacities. Obson describes uh, the passage from one to another kind of interpersonality, which is precisely called as uh, secondary intersubjectivity, as follows. The defining feature of secondary intersubjectivity is that an object or event can become a focus between people. Objects and events can be communicated about. The infant's interactions with another person begin to have reference to the things that surround them. So at the end of a complete and comprehensive description of the intersubjective process, it seems uh, almost obvious that uh, uh, we cannot uh, reduce uh, uh, intersubjectivity to a mental or abstract mechanism. Um, 
nor we can have a mere focus on contexts. Rather, primary and secondary intersubjectivity seem to be two phases of a single process, which includes both sensory motor elements and contextual pragmatic abilities. According to Fuchs, uh, there is uh, another kind, another level of intersubjectivity, which he calls tertiary intersubjectivity, when the infants begin to perceive others as intentional agents and they develop a self-other meta, meta perspective. So <clears throat> Uh, the disruption of uh, all of this level of intersubjectivity is evident uh, in the already in the first stage of autistic disorder. A disorder that seems to affect uh, not only the cognitive abilities of the subject, but also the so-called practognosia, which is the ability to relate to the world in a practical sense and not purely theoretically. Following a phenomenological perspective and keeping in mind what it means to have an intersubjective relation according to this approach, the autistic disorder seems to be a disorder that affects the social skills of the subject as early as the co-subjectivity, so the very first layer we pointed out before, eroding inferential abilities and especially is embodied interaffectivity. So the deficits of the autistic patient can be identified starting from primary intersubjectivity. Very often we can observe disturbances in sensory motor integration, gestalt perception and imitative capacities. As a result, the secondary and tertiary intersubjectivities, which involve the development of higher cognitive abilities, will find great difficulties. So to summarize, uh, in this disorder, we can point out different and interrelated disruptive dimension. We have, of course, uh, the neurobiological disturbances because we need to take into account the neural level. Um, but we also have an intersubjective deficit starting from the first level of intersubjectivity and accordingly in the higher level of social understanding. And then we also have a lack of motor ability. My thesis is that uh, all of these dimensions can be synonymous with the disruption of the bodily and relational sense of self, in other words, of our lived body. And the centrality of the lived body is uh, clear uh, in other pathologies as well, such as melancholic depression a severe form of depression in which the body loses its fluidity, becoming heavy and solid and inhibiting the realization of the subject's intentions. The subject is no longer able to transcend himself and empathize with others and he remains confined to his present bodily state. So we, we can argue that while uh, uh, in autism there is a weak bodily sense of self, in uh, melancholic depression uh, the bodily self is uh, extremely heavy. Uh, this is called hyper embodiment. But the result is the same. The result of this disruption of the corporeal self is a detachment from the intersubjective domain, from the social world. The, the depressed patient cannot perceive his potential to act in the world, his affordances, and space is limited to the surrounding environment. For these reasons, we can define melancholic depression, as I said, as an hyper embodiment. Furthermore, the patient loses his emotional resonance and falls into an anesthetic melancholy. He feels that he's no longer feeling as if he were dead, as if he were a mere material body, a corpse. In this case, the subject also loses his common sense and he perceives himself as cut off from the world because he has lost his embodied sense of self. Otto der Zegers has called this process as a crematization of the body, which becomes so heavy that it can also block its functions. With this in mind, crema, is the inanimate nature of the body which loses its contact with the world. I, I quote from Brampton, why do they call it a mental illness? The pain is not just in my head, it's everywhere, but mainly at my throat and in my heart. Perhaps my heart is broken. Is this what it is? My whole chest feels like it's being crushed. It's hard to breathe. In melancholic depression, 
the body loses its emotional directionality and its static presence becomes an obstacle for the development of phronesis and proctognosia, which are typical of a living body, a life that is dynamically and intersubjectively linked with the world. And these disturbances uh, comprise different but intertwined dimensions, the embodied self, the alteration of the subject's relationship with his own body, the embodied intentionality, the alteration of the relationship of the subjects with the world. In other words, uh, um, the alteration of the patient's embodied affective intentionality. Bloyer has defined this disruption as the alteration of the centrifugal functions that are those functions that connect us with the environment. This disturbance can also appear as a missing of the patient's bodily resonance in the context of an intercorporeal and interfective dialogue during the diagnostic process itself. And then the embodied time. We have the alteration of biological and existential rhythms. So we can define melancholic depression as a form of alienation from the interpersonal and the intercorporeal world. So, uh, at this point, uh, we can ask how phenomenology can be helpful in addressing and explaining these kinds of disruptions. So firstly, providing notions such as lived body, intersubjectivity, and so on, which are able to explain the complexity of the patient's experience. Then providing, or I hope, qualitative tool able not only to explore the subjective experience, but also uh, to elaborate new therapies that take the subjective lead bodies into account. So for this reason, in the last part of my talk, I will outline two phenomenologically informed tools I elaborated. The first one is a phenomenological interview. What is a phenomenological interview? It's a semi-structured interview informed by phenomenological concepts, such as, of course, the lived body, intercorporeality, and so on, that allow to grasp the experience of a person as it is actually lived through by her. And uh, um, this is important to overcome a mere biological perspective on psychiatric illness and to have a more comprehensive view of the process of psychiatric diagnosis and treatment. Furthermore, um, a phenomenological interview is helpful because uh, um, it gives access to uh, the subjective experience of the person involved in the clinical encounter, allowing the understanding of those structures of subjectivity that are disrupted in the pathology. And it's also helpful in uh, enhancing uh, a concrete therapeutic relationship, eliciting uh, the, um, a sort of reciprocal relationality because uh, it deletes a sense of, of isolation. The, in the phenomenological interview, there are no um, prepare and schematize questions because it is semi-structured. So uh, the clinician and the patient can uh, uh, have a reciprocal uh, dialogue uh, uh, and improvise, so a very spontaneous one. More specifically, uh, what I have done is uh, an interview uh, which was aimed to uh, grasp the subjective structure of uh, an Asperger subjects. I developed this interview in 2016 thanks to the collaboration of uh, Stella Maris Science Institute. And uh, my main aims were to explore the phenomenal experience of the subject collecting qualitative first-person reports, so a phenomenal exploration, and to understand the life world of the patient, his basic structures and existential dimension. In fact, the eight themes were the self, other, space, time, and body. So a sort of transphenomenal exploration. The phenomenological notions that I have taken into account were the epoche, I asked the subject to bracket all of his prejudices and previous knowledge in order to free his intimate self, 
the going back to the thing themselves, the purpose of the interview was to acquire detailed first-person descriptions of the experience of the subjects, the invariant structure, so the analysis was explicitly committed to finding his existentialia, space, time, body, self, and other, and uh, the importance of the living body the very object of my work actually in this case i try to find the role of the body in relation to alterity the interview started with a test i formulated personally and which consists in the visualization of 25 pictures which are uh, uh, in the focus of the analysis the subject could choose from among four options. Uh, the first two were related to one of the subjective structures, for instance, in the case, uh, of course, the, the existential at stake were uh, the other. Uh, and uh, the first two options were love and uh, incommunicability. The latter two concern other cognitive abilities uh, or details. Uh, for instance, physical laws and colors. So during the first stage, I asked to the subject to complete the tests according to his own suggestions. While in the second phase of the interview, I asked him what he thought the painters or photographers wanted to represent to their creations. In this way, I try to analyze his capacity of taking another's point of view. So I try to understand if he had a theory of mind. Privileging, uh, then, I conducted a semi-structured interview using the pictures as stimuli and questions about beliefs, emotions, and so on, trying to explore his subjectivity in a quasi-direct manner. Privileging reciprocity, it happened that the subject moved up my questions as well as my questions adapted to his statements. And in order to make the test scientifically valid, I also interview neurotypical male 18 years old subjects. So I could compare the results. Now, uh, a little bit of information about uh, the uh, Asperger subjects I didn't interview with Matthew. Matthew is an 18 years old male with Asperger syndrome. He self-diagnosed his disorder a couple of years ago, but when he was a child, he was labeled an emotional disturbed subject. His very high IQ, 139, allows him to live an almost normal life, although he suffers from isolated crises due to anxiety and obsessive thoughts. His Asperger involves uh, difficulties in communication and the development of specific areas of interest, both typical features of autism. Talking to him was very important for my work because it allowed me to observe a pure lack of intersubjectivity. Specifically, why Matthew successfully passed the test on the theory of mind, his descriptions of the painting were very detailed, like an art historian. <laughs> His answers about his own description of the images were very peculiar. In fact, he gave a majority of three and four answers, always, where the neurotypical subjects answered using the first two options. In other words, it seems that Matthew completely or almost completely ignores the data which refer to his subjectivity. Another important difference concerns the use of language. While the typical development subject used metaphoric language, Matthew affirmed that language represents one of his major problems. In fact, he does not understand the ambiguities involved in everyday language. And I think that this could be read as a manifestation of his lack of common sense. In fact, he has problems not only in the relational use of language, but also in the understanding of corporeal gestures. In the test uh, reading the mind in the eyes, he obtained a very low score because he was not able to associate specific expressions to determinate emotions. For this reason, he cannot understand others and consequently the shared meaning of language and conventions. He lacks some features 
which are specific to corporate, such as the relationality, motor intentionality, and so on. And he describes himself with an expression that uh, I adore. He describes himself as a spontaneous transgressive, a person who has a peculiarity in his way of thinking and his, his practical behavior. His social life consists in organized events because he's not able to improvise. So his disorder seems to be all but cognitive. On the contrary, it seems to belong to a pre-reflective domain. As, as a confirmation to my hypothesis, it told me that sometimes he thinks that others could read in his mind the phenomenon of transitivism and uh, they pretend not to. Furthermore, he hates corporeal contact because he perceives it as an invasion. And all of these elements support the thesis according to which his corporeal sense of self is very weak and disrupted, causing problems in the perception of, of others and the world. So to summarize, a phenomenological analysis has allowed me to conclude that our self is corporeal and it in, in its multi-layer definition able to take into account different levels of inquiry which comprehend in a gestaltic manner both the biological level, so the corpor, and the lived experience, the life. And that our intersubjectivity does not depend on mentalization or simulation, but on pre reflective and corporeal elements. And uh, uh, the second uh, uh, tool which I would like to account for uh, is uh, a model, uh, a, mo a therapeutic model. Uh, um, which I developed starting from a um, Rispan and Wither proposal because uh, uh, I asked myself how to support people who fall out of this corporeal synchrony of, in this intercorporeal dance. Um, in 1980, Stanley Grispan and Serena Wither developed a particular kind of therapy called the DIR model in the treatment of autistic patient. But I, I think that it can be useful also in other pathologies such as schizophrenia and depression, which involve corporeal and intercorporeal disruptions. Uh, we can summarize the DIR model as it follows. We have the developmental stage, a very basic level, which needs to be taken into account by therapists, and that involves uh, the developmental capacities of the subjects, which are essential for spontaneous and empathic relationships. Then we have the individual difference uh, layer. The DIR model emphasizes the fact that each child has a unique biologically based manners to take in, regulate, and respond to the environment and sensations. In fact, in the, the autism spectrum disorders, some children are hypersensitive to sound, for instance, others are uh, uh, less reactive to touch, and so on. And then we have the relationship-based stage. This stage involves the learning relationship with the caregiver and therapist. And like phenomenology, sheds light on the intersubjective nature of the subject. The authors argue that in order to help people affected by autistic spectrum disorder, the therapist should try to develop the practical and emotional understanding of the world. At the center of the model, is the so-called floor time, a spontaneous interaction between the autistic child and the adult, which is helpful for the improvement of motor and social skills. It's interesting to notice that this model uh, has uh, some similarities with the phenomenological approach because uh, like phenomenology, the DIR model uh, hypothesis uh, emphasizes the centrality of intentionality, the openness of the subject toward the world. Um, the reciprocity, the fact that the subject constitutes herself in an intersubjective manner, and emotions. Our engagement towards the world is emotionally and axiologically characterized. It's undoubtedly that this proposal tends to strengthen the interaffective skills of the subjects. Nonetheless, it does not take into account corporeality, the true core of uh, intersubjectivity. For this reason, I would like to modify uh, this approach by creating a corporeal proposal that also emphasizes the, uh, the emotional intercorporeal components. 
I do this by maintaining all of the original elements and adding the emphasis on embodiment. In this view, the DIR model becomes the DIRE model, a therapeutic approach that also takes embodiment into account. Adding a role for embodiment makes it possible to enlarge the therapy by focusing more specifically on strengthening and recovering the kinesthetic corporeal self and consequently the intercorporeal engagement with others. And this can be done, for instance, with dance therapy, somatic therapies, and so on. We can conclude that one cannot be a self on one's own. My perspective on disturbances of intersubjectivity sheds light on the fact that our self is usually essentially dynamical and interpersonal and is a keep with an implicit relational knowing, an embodied intuitive knowledge of how to interact with others, how to dance with others, which arises long before verbal communications. Here we have some references and thank you for your attention. I hope it was not too much. <laughs> thank you, Valeria. This was uh, excellent. Thanks for uh, your presentation. And also the sources I think are uh, very useful. You gave us uh, excellent uh, quotes and references to navigate this uh, complex uh, field of studies. Okay, I have stop share. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So now we can see you fully. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so now I give the floor to the audience if uh, there's uh, any question for um, Dr. Bizzari. Um, you can break the ice or I will break the ice. Okay, I see all your faces now, more or less. Uh, <laughs> and I think again, I will be the icebreaker. Um, yeah, I have so many questions actually. Uh, they are mostly curiosity. Yeah, one first question uh, I'd be curious to um, address is uh, how much uh, did you manage to um, reach with uh, your uh, intersubject? intercorporeal approach uh, with a person that you were uh, in dialogue with, uh, with a young, um, young kid uh, who was uh, suffering from Asperger? Well, um, it was uh, enlightening for me because uh, I, I had the chance to really observe what I had just read. <laughs> so if you um, try to um, to study intersubjectivity but also try to analyze intersubjectivity through an intersubjective encounter which sounds like a paradox it's a, it's a challenge uh, of course i think i was very lucky because it was a high functioning mm -hmm. autistic subjects uh, but uh, i also had the opportunity to um, interview, uh, as I told you yesterday, schizophrenic patients. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, it was uh, very instructive for me because, okay, you, you can observe that there is a disruption. Sometimes they, they are not even aware of their the body. Some, oh, this is not my this is not my arm. I don't know what it is. You remain like okay, but on the other hand, you can observe that they are hungry of relationality. So um, we should not imagine someone which is completely detached from uh, the social uh, uh, domain but someone uh, who lives uh, in this uh, uh, very weird world and is trying with a lot of effort uh, to relate to others. And, and this is, uh, especially in the case of Asperger syndrome, this is what uh, struggles them the most. So uh, sometimes it's very difficult because sometimes uh, uh, some patients uh, do not want to be interviewed by me. <laughs> so, uh, and that's it. So, but uh, yeah, uh, on the other hand, uh, 
uh, it's uh, I think it's uh, the best manner to to realize what intersubjectivity amounts to. Uh, and I didn't have time, but uh, we could also talk about the different uh, layers of uh, collective intentionality. So, um, for instance, when we do music therapy together with the schizophrenic patient, you realize that uh, they can be able to deal with the, the so-called joint intentionality, so they can, uh, and also of course autistic patients can uh, participate in joint action and uh, perform a piece together, but uh, uh, they experience difficulties uh, with the, the emotional collective layer. So they are not able to uh, feel a, a sort of collective emotion or uh, uh, to uh, be involved in, uh, in, in, in a friendship, which, which, is, which is a collective, uh, uh, a collective uh, layer different in, in another sense. So uh, I think that uh, work with uh, patients can be extremely useful to observe uh, the different kinds of intersubjective engagement. We can also have uh, a patient which has the co-subjectivity completely disrupted, so uh, it does not experience, it's not able to perceive uh, correctly an object, but uh, uh, is able to, uh, to feel shared emotions and, and also the contrary. So, um, my aim is to understand uh, uh, which are exactly those layers uh, and which are the requirements and then uh, how they are entangled with one another. But of course I need empirical data. <laughs> but do you think that phenomenology can have uh, a therapy, therapeutic uh, quality? So do you think that phenomenology can actually help uh, these participants uh, to recover from uh, this lack of uh, intersubjective skills uh, or uh, is it something just theoretical that phenomenology does? I think that phenomenology can for sure support uh, the, the work of the clinician providing uh, the notions because uh, for, for uh, I noticed that for the clinician itself, it was very useful to understand what is at stake because they really rely on a very general understanding of sociality. So uh, if they mm -hmm. you know, take into account the different layers, they are not able to, to understand what exactly is going on. So phenomenology in this sense can provide uh, a, a theoretical uh, and conceptual background, but also, and uh, I mean, for instance, also the work of Stangelini and so on, can be therapeutic in the sense uh, that it can improve the therapeutic, the therapeutic relationship through the phenomenological interview. Otherwise, we, we, you have uh, a very detached that the formal manner to tune in with the patient. Uh, you don't tune in at all. And yes, of course, uh, uh, it's not enough. Uh, it's, uh, it's also nice to see how phenomenology can be combined with uh, clinical perspectives and we, we can uh, have a mutual enlightenment. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah, no monads. I have a question from a student uh, or a participant, a guest. Um, so, um, uh, she, I suppose who knows, is asking uh, um, to unfold a little bit more about uh, um, your comment uh, about Matthew's uh, uh, wanting to avoid uh, eye contact. So she does uh, appreciate the, um, yeah, the description that you made of, uh, uh, yeah, Bonita Diaz. Okay, we have her name because here I see only the initials. Uh, so uh, yeah, she, uh, she's curious to know if that belongs to autism in general, you know, not being able to establish uh, an eye contact uh, or, uh, uh, and uh, feeling that as invasion of privacy uh, or, uh, yeah, if it's um, something that belongs just to that person, to Matthew. Thank you. 
So uh, concerning the eye contact is one of the main uh, characterizing feature of autistic subjects, but of, of course it's, we, we cannot confine, you know, uh, I mean, I don't like to um, associate specific symptom uh, to only to one pathology because I think that uh, we need a more comprehensive view on mental illness in general there is not you know a specific list and that's it but uh, yes eye contact is usually associated with autism spectrum disorder concerning the other phenomenon which is a very important one the phenomenon of transitivism when you you feel that other people can read in your mind <laughs> uh, this is not confined to autism on the contrary this is usually associated with schizophrenia in fact, there is someone who supports the thesis according to which autism, can, Asperger, can be a very first stage of, a prodromal stage of schizophrenia. But this is one, one theory among a million of adults. Transitivism is usually associated with schizophrenia where, where yourself is fragmented to such an extent that uh, uh, the, the boundaries between you and others are, are, are broken. So you are feel like uh, you are invaded by others. It's, uh... Thank you. Anyone else have questions? Yeah. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, it's not clear for me that uh, if you take primary intersubjectivity uh, dependent on, upon uh, other types of intersubjectivity or not, if uh, if you uh, see primary intersubjectivity as an independent form of intersubjectivity, mm -hmm. then uh, can we uh, ascribe some forms of intersubjectivity to human uh, robots interactions? Because even robots can uh, um, respond to uh, human gestures or recognize facial uh, expressions. Uh, so okay. can we ascribe uh, intersubjectivity uh, to human robot uh, relationships? So robots uh, don't uh, have su uh, subjectivity, I suppose. So. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. This is a very tricky question, but uh, yeah, you, you, you. I think you may be right because uh, you, actually uh, primary intersubjectivity corresponds to what you said, and they are abilities present in, in robo interaction. But uh, yes, of course, primary intersubjectivity is it's not uh, um, sufficient to account for uh, intersubjectivity as we, as we conceive of it. So it's uh, a very first layer. Um, and also when, uh, uh, I think that uh, when uh, uh, robo are, uh, have been uh, uh, built, they, they are built in such an, a manner that uh, they can uh, have a sort, not of a corporeal schema, but uh, um, they act as if they would be a sort of uh, a human body in our, in our imaginary at least. So, uh, I, for instance, uh, uh, Husserl speaks about the ghost and they say that the ghost has a corporeal schema, even if it does not exist. But in our, if you want to conceive a ghost, we have to take into account that it's something that can move and so on. I think that uh, for the robot, inter for robots that are able to interact, uh, it can be the same. So that they, they should have uh, something which is not a lie, of course, uh, but something that uh, has this uh, sufficient conditions to recognize human faces and so on. But of course, it's a very, very first layer and it's not sufficient to account for intersubjectivity, especially from a phenomenological point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but this uh, question, this lead is very interesting because I wonder about the development of phenomenology in artificial intelligence because now we have uh, the value sensitive designing uh, programming, programming for which, you know, if uh, the designer, if the engineers uh, receive uh, good descriptions uh, of uh, what uh, uh, human emotional life is, uh, 
they might be able to, uh, you know, create uh, create codes that are intelligent enough to allow this uh, this interaction also. So, and phenomenology does that. I mean, phenomenology is the philosophical field that uh, wants to get to the descriptions, of the description that is as exact as possible. And uh, there are already, yeah, ma learning uh, machines like Bobot, uh, for example, uh, who tries to handle depression. So, yeah, yeah they are built on uh, the behavioral uh, model. Uh, behavioral psychology, uh, but it could be interesting to see how, uh, you know, to create a dialogue uh, in this area because uh, uh, it might be possible to create something similar that is not based on only a behavioral approach but a phenomenological one so that uh, the machine can learn and uh, help the person to improve uh, its uh, intersubjective skills. That's so fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And actually, it's a question that uh, arises uh, when I talk about corporeality, especially. Yeah. I remember that once someone uh, asked me about the film Hair. I don't know if you are familiar, Hair. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I think so. It's a wonderful movie where in a futuristic place where the main subject uh, uh, falls in love with uh, an artificial intelligence. Yeah, 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 yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but I think that also in this case, and it's explicitly in a, in a, in a certain passage of the movie, uh, the user uh, imagines uh, the artificial intelligence uh, as, as alive, as a living body. This is the reason why he's able to, fall, to fall in love with her. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Yeah, there's the need of uh, a body. For sure, we cannot escape from that. So I have uh, a, a, another question, but uh, again, uh, if anyone in the audience uh, wants to ask something, uh, uh, just uh, write to me and I will give you the floor. Uh, yeah, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, intercorporeality? Because uh, you were giving the example of, uh, you know, the schizophrenic having problem of recognizing its own hand. Uh, so what's the healthy boundaries between feeling uh, interconnected uh, and somehow feeling the other as uh, an important other, as important as you are, uh, and uh, feeling completely disconnected. How would you describe this uh, intercorporeal unit, the healthy one, let's say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, uh, intercorporeality and interaffectivity as well. I wish that Professor Fuchs will talk about that because uh, it's, uh, it's better than me in explaining these notions, uh, are... Uh, uh, concept that are very linked to one another um, and uh, I think uh, because I started my, my work uh, um, with the notion of life in general but now I am focusing more specifically uh, on intercorporeality because I think that uh, um, not for the OT spectrum in general but in the Asperger syndrome for instance what is missing is indeed intercorporeality exactly intercorporeality and by intercorporeality, I mean uh, this uh, synchrony which uh, spontaneously arises and that uh, dynamically connect us with the world and with the other. So we, we should imagine ourselves uh, as uh, embedded in a context and constantly, constantly, um, passively, or, and not only actively, being modified and modifying others perspectives. So we are immersed in this uh, shared world and we are constantly engaged in uh, inter intercorporeal relationship. Uh, intercorporeality, so the medium of our bodies, uh, 
uh, allows for uh, interaffectivity. Right. And interaffectivity is, uh, is the main, you know, important uh, uh, requirement for uh, a healthy intersubjectivity because uh, we don't have only bodies that are mutually related, but we have feeling bodies and we are able to feel together, to choose to feel or, or do not feel together, uh, to respond to, our, to others' actions and so on. In the schizophrenia, for instance, but also in autism, something uh, is, uh, is missing or is impaired in intercorporeality, and this uh, uh, hinders the arising of interaffectivity. So in the inter interaffectivity is completely uh, disrupted. In autism, uh, we have uh, uh, people who are not able to handle with the emotional domain. In, uh, in, in schizophrenia, on the other hand, we have people who are overwhelmed by interaffectivity. They feel so much that they are not able to, to, to handle. In depression, on the other hand, interaffectivity is completely absent. They, they, they feel that the feeling of having no feelings, that is a feeling itself. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the main important thing in a healthy or neurotypical subject is this passage from intercorporeality to interaffectivity, yeah. which is automatically, usually, they are, usually they are entangled to one another, but in the pathology there, there is something which is broken. Thank you. That's very helpful. So you think that uh, uh, the autistic, the Asperger uh, um, uh, person would not uh, have the ability to be modified, uh, so there's something uh, stuck on the level of the passive intentionality or so, or uh, he is modified, he, she, they, but uh, uh, there's no awareness of modification. So at that point is active intentionality and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, where is the... So, um... I think that, uh, for instance, in the case of, of Matthew, at least uh, there is this, this will to modify, but uh, I think that the problem is in, in the passive synthesis, uh, if we can speak about it, in the sense that they, they can learn to uh, not to feel because they feel, they can learn to handle with uh, the emotional domain, but not uh, in a spontaneous manner. So this is the reason why I, I like the expression used by Matthew. I am a spontaneous transgressive because he's a teenager. You know, he told me, ah, oh, my, my classmates uh, want to be different from the others. I am naturally different <laughs> from the others. <laughs> but uh, he's interested in others. The problem is that he doesn't know how to do. So, uh, for instance, uh, um, somatic therapies, uh, also meditation. He, he, for instance, he does mindfulness. He practices mindfulness and it's very helpful to him. Mm -hmm. um, it, all of these kinds of activities can be helpful to elicit a little bit the spontaneous uh, interaffectivity, but uh, uh, I don't like to, to, to speak about uh, autism as it, is, as it is, is because it's not. But we can, we can say that you cannot, uh, you cannot change. It's, it's your peculiar attitude toward the world. Right. And uh, a very interesting uh, manuscript that I uh, read recently by uh, Georg Frankl, which is a Jewish psychiatrist, uh, um, talk about uh, uh, affective language. He says that uh, autistic subjects own, uh, they own affective language. So the therapist and the caregivers can help them uh, in understanding this kind of language and then to adapt themselves. So why, for, and this can be helpful, helpful in also improving the everyday life of these people. So we can uh, reason in about uh, the different manners to take in regulate emotions, but it remains different. Yeah. 
I absolutely agree with you. It's uh, up to us uh, to get rid of uh, the notion of uh, normality and uh, focus on uh, intersubjectivity, intercorporeality, you know, spread the, our ability to, to understand and interact with all the peculiarities that we have. And that is, I think, another important aspect of bioethics because yeah. Yeah, yeah. we focus on what is uh, the right manner and uh, often we rely on medications in order to get there without accepting the actual yeah. essence of, uh, of the person. So, um, yeah, we actually lose the peculiarity of uh, people in this way. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have questions here? No questions, really, curiosities you want to address? Uh, uh anything at all really she can she, she works with uh, <laughs> yeah with uh, these kinds of problems so it's a, a unique uh, interlocutor to ask uh, questions to not really all right so yeah i think i will let you go valeria and maybe i will uh, <laughs> i will ask you more questions <laughs> by email personally okay okay uh, yeah okay. there's uh, uh bonita is uh, is joining us in the conversation and she appreciates yeah this last point about the importance yeah, of understanding the life of person before uh, uh, actually being able to help because yeah absolutely you don't know if you are actually helping if you just impose yourself uh, with uh, your idea of what is right it's a complete uh, lack of empathy yeah. this is the reason why psychiatry needs philosophy <laughs> eh, yeah that's uh, another <laughs> nice point to make i mean uh, a philosophy has uh, the unique job of uh, just be there and observe uh, the actual lived experience. So, um, yeah, psychiatry and psychology, clinicians, social workers uh, can actually benefit from the philosophical observation. So, there's space for integration. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned that in your presentation, you and Professor Fuchs, um, who is going to present. Uh, uh, very soon, uh, you are actually working in uh, with clinicians and psychiatrists, uh, so you have an exceptional uh, privileged point of view to you know work in theory and in practice uh, in cooperation with the different fields. Uh, anyway, I thank uh, all of you for uh, joining and uh, being here. Uh, um, next week, we are going to present on the phenomenology of the suffering. Uh, I thank you, Valeria, for uh, the excellent uh, talk. Thank you for the patience, because I thought a lot. <laughs> it was uh, absolutely our pleasure. And uh, yeah, uh, if uh, you have questions uh, you want to ask her, uh, uh, you can again email me and I will uh, forward it and you can find her talk uh, on YouTube. Uh, so thank you so much, Valeria.